Well, the truth is stranger than it used to be. It's about that simple. So what I want to talk about today begins with a story, which is my personal experience, the only kind I've ever had. First of all, my story begins as many young children's story begins in the early 60s, coming to awareness of the differences and the deep divisions that were a part of my world. Uh, meeting my first black person, discovering that there was an Aboriginal history before our time and that the people who were part of that were living 50 miles away at a place called Akwesasane and further north in a place called the uh, Algonquin Band of Golden Lake. Then the realization as a public school child that there were people at another school called a separate school and that they were somehow different from us and not entirely trustworthy either because I was raised on the Orange Lodge half of our township. <laughs> now, I'm sure some of those things, as well as the fact that my Presbyterian father had married a Baptist mother who had once been an Anglican and was leaning towards Pentecostalism, introduced me into all kinds of complications because we had Pentecostal cousins and the vacation with them was very different from my Baptist cousins who were very different from my Presbyterian cousins, and then it got even more complicated because our township could only afford one high school. <laughs> All thrown together in grade nine to sort ourselves out. But you see, that was also a period of ferment when, although there were many goodwill attempts to homogenize Canada, uh, assimilation, counter-assimilation, you might say pro-assimilation, pre-assimilation and post-assimilation, modernism, which was mostly what it was all about intellectually, and then post-modernism, everyone decided the best thing to do when it came to spirituality and religion was just not talk. The problem with that, of course, is if you live in a dysfunctional family, not talking is the norm and it doesn't help. And I sense at this point in my life you know, it's taken me 53 years to get this talk ready, so please be patient. I'm seeing a development that is not only disturbing, but unnecessary. And I'd like to address that today with my own experience, plus about, uh, well, I, I live in the past. People who are long dead are some of my best friends. And you learn from them, you know? Um, that's why my life is a forensic exercise in, re in rehabilitating thoughts that have been long dead and buried and realizing that they're actually pretty handy to have around. So bear with me. Because this is a TED talk, the design side of this is very important to me as well, because I am an artist. It's not well known, and among some of my friends who see my art, it probably is disputed, but I am an artist. And so the design of my books, the design of my teaching, the design of my life is intentional. It's not always under my control, however, but it is intentional. And so what I like to do is often map my ideas. So in your imagination, just kind of map with me for a minute as we talk about this. First of all, maps are the floor plans of history. If you want to know what's going to happen, it helps to know the contours of our experience, our history, and especially the ground that we dwell on. And that comes to our religious traditions and our spiritualities as well. There is a unique genius, a unique caliber to spiritualities of the desert. There is a unique cali a genius and, and quality of spiritualities of the jungle and the forest. And believe me, there is an ultimate spirituality that is austere and elegant and desperately pragmatic if you live in the Arctic. It's important to understand, therefore, that these things do not develop by accident. So the first marker I want to put on my map is that all the great world religions have deep, deep roots and essential integrity that must be understood. They often have common themes, but it is an error, a classical error, a modernist era to homogenize them into some kind of generic, everything is beautiful in its own way, uh, which is a Ray Stevens song, not a way to put a country together. Secondly, that means that rather than homogenize, we must sense and understand and, and grasp the differences, the oppositions of spiritualities that come from across the whole earth 
that often are thousands of years old and which are now together in this country called Canada, which enjoys the wealth and the benefits of imposing itself on another spirituality which was here long before. As one of my Mi'kmaq friends has told me, God did not get off the boat with Columbus. He was not a passenger arriving in a virgin soil land uh, with the explorers. God had been here for a long time, doing quite well, thank you. Uh, I found that mostly God has no problems. We do. I'm not even going to use the word God because it's actually a misnomer. Uh, God happens to be a, t a Teutonic pagan name for a God that's addressed mostly by people of the book who are all monotheists of one kind or another. And it's like the word Easter, which comes from a dawn goddess, has nothing to do with either Passover or Jesus, but somehow has become the Western calendar name for that special weekend, which I think at one time, one of the great greeting card companies tried to have standardized on the calendar to make it easier for business planning and approached the United States president around World War I to suggest that he could declare it a fixed day on the calendar. I don't think the president had any intention of addressing Hallmark or FTD on that issue. Some things are really beyond presidential control. But therefore, if we map out the deep origins and the deep roots, if we match out and, and understand and map in the unique context, the land and the people who carry those identities with them and those spiritualities, if we recognize that some sense of trying to grab everything that's all the same and boiling it down to one common creed, A, violates history, B, insults the integrity of each spirituality, and C, just doesn't work and has failed miserably in the modern project, we begin to understand what not to do. All the great traditions also talk about a pathway and a pilgrimage of one kind or another that involves a journey that says, and this is the point, they're not the same, but they say one word quite often, turn. Turn from the path you pursue and learn. Seek illumination. How you seek illumination often has, again, integrities, the great journey. Joseph Campbell was no fool as he wrote the book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. At the same time, again, the past and the present are in the Continuum of spirituality never far from us, and frankly, neither is the future. I live in the past, I dream about the future, and I see things for the present. And I love silence, because that is often where we must turn to grasp our tradition deeply enough to then engage in respectful coexistence with the other traditions. We live in a world where silence is discouraged, where silence is blotted out and paved over, where the concrete fields of modernity actually make silence a sin. It's called dead air in radio and television. And we don't even want it in our minds because silence is sometimes, where dark or bright, but always life-changing things emerge to talk to us, to ask us, to call to us. Sometimes it is the silence of the midnight insomnia or the silence of the early morning waking where you can't get back to sleep. Not just one morning, but four weeks in a row that begins to speak about the most important things that we need to turn to and give attention. So, turn, learn, live in some silence, make silence, and then begin the journey. In that process, there is work to do. It is not easy, it is not simple, it is not even practical to do the kind of responsible learning we need to do with traditions not our own. But it is essential to respect the integrity of those traditions, and out of that respect and out of that understanding begin to put a life of study and attentiveness to these other traditions to engage in some meaningful communication. Because communication, community, all the values that people talked about today, all the important aspects of living anywhere come from paying attention, coming to grasp, by the way, don't empathize 
cheaply because it will cost you something to empathize. The truth of all spiritualities is that the price of a life is a sacrifice. What will you sacrifice to follow the one? What will you sacrifice to follow the way? What will you sacrifice? What will you offer, even of your body, in service of the divine? What kind of fast? What kind of exertion? What kind of learning? And what kind of loving is needed to live in a pluralistic, multi-faith world? And I suggest for most of us, if we go back to the spirituality we came with, and, and understand and dwell in that spirituality, we will find deep and profound answers. Because frankly, the spirituality that I inherited and the one that I own has been the spirituality that has been the matrix, and I use that word intentionally, because most of it was taught to me by women with which to live in a multi-faith world today. And frankly, the people I work with and for are learning the same thing. And it's no coincidence that almost half of them are women today in our Canadian forces. Let me offer you a, ma a maxim. Minister and worship with people of your tradition. Facilitate the worship of others in their tradition and care for all. That is the maxim under which our military trains its chaplains. There is no generic government religion. And there never will be. If there is, it will be invented by bureaucrats and systematically ignored. <laughs> like most of our bureaucrats are today, and it's a good thing too. There are real differences that must be boundaries. There are differences that must be learned and respected. It's more than just not offering a ham sandwich to the field rabbi under fire. Although, frankly, under fire, he might just take it if the rations haven't come up anyway. It's more than just remembering what day of the year it is in a different calendar, although that certainly helps but is developing the capacity to fathom what's often said and not said, and when a yes means no, and when a no actually means yes, and keep the communication progressing. I really think that many of our issues today around spirituality come from the fact that most of us have been raised in a climate where it's just not been talked about, kind of like sex. Except now we have it backwards. Sex is talked about incessantly. Spirituality is the scandalous word that stops conversations everywhere. In fact, God is the dirtier three-letter word than sex in most discussions, right? Except that with either, neither of them you can kind of walk by and say, but not in the South, and keep on moving like you know something. <laughs> and that's where we carry in our lives one of the greatest opportunities and sometimes one of the greatest burdens to turn and learn and respect out of that turning and learning that there are great things to be offered out there, great things to be learned. And frankly, having lived in another culture, I became more Canadian in that year than I ever thought I was. In the same way you will find in your spiritual tradition, whatever that is, by the way, you have a freedom to adopt other spiritualities, to be prepared, to be awkward and out of place and maybe not entirely understood for a few years. It's like getting married, it takes time. A lot of time in communication and often being misunderstood. It's like anthropology. Because after all, in anthropology, what's the biggest mistake? That is to ascribe motivation to something you don't understand. We brought um, 27 Cambodians from the killing fields to Kingston, Ontario. They arrived on Halloween. <laughs> Imagine. We get an excited phone call in French and Cambodian. Why are these dream demons, four feet high and less, coming to the door, holding out bags at us, one after the other, and they never seem to stop? What have you brought us to? Are you here? Did you bring us here to drive us mad? And of course, no one had explained what Halloween was. To ascribe a motive to that would be to end trust and communication. I think that's the danger here, 
that we have with all the spiritualities in this country today is we instinctively cross-reference the six o'clock news with some of our paranoid habits and traditions, our desire for uniformity that comes from largely a culture of prosperity and laziness to essentially the question of, but if you're different, how can I trust you? You have to know enough about those traditions to know, as I do now, from learning at their feet, just how much trustworthiness and integrity are among all the great virtues which have been celebrated and taught here today. How, in fact, the relationship that is practiced is not even always the relationship that is conceived and is the dream of all the great religious traditions in family and marriage and fatherhood and motherhood. Do you know why elders repeat themselves so much? Because they don't want to leave anything out. Live a conservationist life. Sometimes we're more worried about someone changing the relationship of a species to its environment that we forget about the relationship of a person to the divine and to the environment they live in. Because my last point is this, why is the only question, and it's the hardest one. We talk about how. Our modernist world is obsessed with how, and the postmodern world has been obsessed with how badly it has been done. Truth is constructed by dead white men, among whom I shall soon be, if I live badly. <laughs> Maybe if I live correctly, because I don't know when I'm going to die. Most of us do not know that we actually have a best before date stamped on us somewhere, and we are going to realize it one day, and then what? Why is the question? How is how to get there? Isaac Newton separated those questions years ago, and John Locke separated those questions years ago, and that's how we got the Enlightenment. That's how we got modernity. But it doesn't solve our problem. We are caught with an epistemic crisis, high philosophical language, where we don't know how we know and what we know. We are caught with ontological debate about what being really is, and in the middle is our metaphysics, which is how things work, and we're all obsessed with how things work, and we've forgotten about the epistemic and ontological questions that make how have meaning. Chaplains are meaning makers. So are people deeply interested in their spiritual tradition and prepared to make the sacrifices necessary, which, by the way, are not always huge, but to get to the genius of that spirituality. Because it's something else you should know. All the great traditions have it within them traditions within traditions. As one of my friends said, everybody has denominations, duff. If you think about all the traditions we have in the great world religions, we think of the 500 kinds of spiritualities that have existed in indigenous people around the earth over the years. Uh, their difference is because they're very important and have deep integrity and they work. So then what? We have to say, I think, that within all those traditions, there is variety. The divine provides for and blesses variety, which means the differences are very important, not just the similarities. And finally, every tradition I've studied, and I've been roaming around for about 5,000 years of recorded history now, um, is that they all have built within them a self-renewing dynamic. In fact, the genius of all the great religions is that they self-renew on a regular basis often by going back to the roots. Jesus once said, and he says it fairly often, it wasn't this way in the beginning, which is often the answer we have to look for to the question, how did we get into this mess? The why question, not just the how question. And the answer is often found not in technique, as Jacques Ellul himself pointed out years ago. It's not in method. It's in silence and in love. It's in love. <laughs> there may be something wrong with what I'm saying today. So if you see a sudden spurt, a flash, and I disappear in a column of blue smoke, <laughs> or it may just me and my three natural enemies, fire, time, and small appliances. <laughs> but let me tell you this. This is what I know, that the time I've invested in silence 
and the time I've invested in doing my due diligence, but most of the time I spent listening in respectful presence with some of the greatest teachers from other religions I have known comes from knowing my own tradition well enough to be comfortable in their presence and to be humble enough to be taught. I have received wonderful spiritual counsel in my darkest days from a Sunni Muslim and on different days a Shia Muslim. I'm in constant dialogue with an Ahmadiyya community. I also have worked with and been instructed by rabbis from all the great traditions. I have sat with elders who have generously shared. There is a saying in Cree culture, a teaching I received that when the student is ready, the teacher, the teacher, the teacher appears. I, th I think our, I think our time has come for that to be true in Canada and in the world. In fact, in our country, we are preparing many people who are ready. I think more than ever, as dark as it seems out there, we are at the time now when students are ready. And then I believe that in the prophecy, the teachers appear. <laughs>